Hello guys. Now it's my turn to read a book. Now I know this is one of Asher's favorites, but I think everybody likes this one. Ready? There's a hair in my dirt. And I'll try not to read it with too many, uh, too many voices because I don't think Asher likes the voices too much. So we'll do that. But I will show you the pictures. So it's a little bit of a long one, but that's okay. Because what else do we have to do? See, there's a hair in my dirt. Okay, ready. It's a worm's story. Beneath the floor of a very old forest, nestled in amongst some nice rich topsoil, lived a family of worms, earthworms to be exact. One evening, the three of them, father, mother, and their little worm son, sat down to their usual dinner, which was dirt. See the little family there? They had just begun to dine when the little worm, staring wide-eyed at his meal, suddenly spit out his food and screamed, there's a hair in my dirt. There's a hair in my dirt. And sure enough, there it was, plain as day. They could all see it. You see the hair in his dirt right there? See? Okay. <clears throat> At first, the little worm was horrified, but soon that gave away to just plain mad. I hate being a worm, he screeched, his tiny body trembling. We are the lowest of the low, bottom of the food chain, bird food, fish bait. What kind of life is this anyway? We never go swimming or camping or hiking or anything. Shoot, we never even go to the surface unless it rains, floods us out. All we ever do is crawl around in the stupid ground. Oh, and how can I forget? We eat dirt. We eat dirt for breakfast. We eat dirt for lunch, dirt for dinner. And look, now there's even a hair in my dirt. The final insult. I can't stand it any longer. I hate being a worm. And with that, the little worm slumped back in his chair, exhausted by his outburst. Mother Worm, an expression of concern on her face, looked from her pouting son to Father Worm. She had constantly tried to make their home a cheer as cheery as possible, even going so far as to always putting silverware on the table, despite the fact that none of them had any arms. But Father Worm, a proud invertebrate and a learned member of the annelid phylum, even with his small rudimentary brain, was glaring at what he considered to be an ungrateful and arrogant son. Well, 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 he said, breaking into awkward silence. Let me get this straight. Not only is your mother's dirt not good enough for you, but you feel being a worm isn't exactly a charmed life, eh? A strange glint fell across Father Worm's eye. My boy, I think it's time to tell you a story. See, there they are eating. And there's Father Worm with his pipe, who's going to tell a story about worms. The little worm looked up and sneered sarcastically. If this is one of those about the teenager worm and the insane trout fisherman, I've heard that one a gazillion times. No, no, Father Worm calmly responded. Not that story, though it is a good story. This one is different. This story has a happy ending. I have an idea, Mother Worm chimed in enthusiastically. Let's listen to Father's story and afterwards, Maybe we can all have some fresh, cold dirt for dessert. See, there's the father worm, and there he's telling the story. And there they all sitting at their table.
And so Father Worm cleared his long primitive pharynx, took a futile puff on his dirt-filled pipe, and began the story. See? See, there's the Father Worm with his pipe. Oop, there he is. And there's mom, Mama Worm. And there's the Kid Worm. So here he's telling the story. Once upon a time, in a forest not too far from here, lived a beautiful young maiden. Her name was Harriet, and Harriet loved the magic of nature with all its magnificent plants and animals. See Harriet? That's Harriet's house. One lovely spring morning, she decided to take a stroll along her favorite woodlands trail. What a wondrous things I will see today, Harriet thought to herself. I must say, she was excited as a tapeworm to meet a meat patty. Oh, let me show you that. See, here she's getting ready to go out for her walk in nature. With her first steps, Harriet took a deep breath and filled her lungs with fresh air. Oh, thank you, trees and other plants, she called out. Thank you for making the air so crisp and clean. See, there's Harriet. Well, as any worm with half a ganglion knows, the plants did a little more than just make the air crisp and clean. They made the air air. Every molecule of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere was put there by a plant. And a last, uh, the last time I looked, the living were quite fond of oxygen. Heck, even dead need it. Or they'd hang around a lot longer and get on everybody's nerves. See, It's a bear reading a book. Soon, Harriet met a family of squirrels who came bounding towards her unafraid and looking for a possible treat. Gathering nuts from a nearby tree, Harriet was quick to accommodate them. Oh, you're all so cute, she gushed. See Harriet playing with the squirrels? To be sure, these furry creatures had that cute thing about them real good. Regrettably, you see, Harriet was feeding gray squirrels, a large and aggressive species that had been introduced to this forest and were quite taking over it from the red native squirrels, a smaller, more timid species. All squirrels are rodents, but in the wrong time and place, some of them are rats. See the squirrels there? Around the bend, the forest opened into a meadow of wild flowers as far as the eye could see. My, Harriet exclaimed, bedazzled, I am gazing on a painting. Oh, Mother Nature, what an artist you are. See her standing in the big field there? Oh, Mother Nature, what a sex maniac you are. May you have been a better choice of words for Harriet was actually gazing upon a reproductive battlefield. Using bright colors, nectar, mimicry, deception, and whatever tricks they had up their, their leaves, these floral sirens were competing for the attention of pollinating insects. In a field of flowers, all is fair in bugs and war. See? See all the flowers? A little ways farther, Harriet happened to look down and saw a column of ants crossing the trail. Ah, she smiled, noticing all the eggs they were carrying. Even the littlest creatures take good care of their babies. How adorable. Adorable? Well, as Grandpa Worm used to say, about as adorable as a nest of baby robins. These were Amazon ants, a species that, despite their name, 
live in many parts of the world and specialize in enslavement of other species. And Harriet was watching a raiding party, party returning home with their living booty. Um, this says, author's note, although most slave ants spend their, day, their lives toiling away, i.e. getting up early to milk the aphids, a few escape that fate by doting on the queen. Entomologists often describe these slackers as abdomen kissers. Ask your mommies and daddies about that one. See the ants carrying away the eggs? As the trail widened and the trees thinned out, Harriet heard a rumbling sound. Looking up, she spied a familiar truck heading her way. She immediately recognized the ruggedly handsome and rosy-cheeked character behind the wheel. Hello, Lumberjack Bob, she called, waving her hand excitement, knowing him to be a gentle man with a quick smile and a big heart. See, she's waving to him. Well, kind, big-hearted, and rosy-cheeked he might be, the later caused by expanded capillaries in his skin's dermal layer, but Lumberjack Bob was really just a regular guy with little education doing the job he knew how to do, cutting down ancient trees that were here long before the first intestinal worms came over with the pilgrims. He's silly looking, isn't he? That's the Lumberjack. Harriet then heard a magical sound from the canopy of the trees above. Oh, she cried skyward. Listen to the songs of those happy, happy birds. Well, if those birds were happy, may the garden gods cut me in half with a rusty shovel. Birds sing to communicate, and that's what they were communicating was mostly an array of insults, warnings, and come-ons to members of their own species. In fact, all baby birds are taught by their parents not to even smile or their beaks will break. I think they're just kidding about that. See there's Harriet way down there. This story is for the birds if you ask me, the little worm interrupted suddenly. Some lady taking a walk in the woods Oh, I can't stand the excitement. If you have to tell me a story, you can at least tell me one of the sort of exciting ones like Mr. Dung Beetle finds his field of dreams. Now that's a cool story. I'm telling you this story, said Father Worm rather testily. So just put a fish hook in that mouth of yours and let me finish. Now, where was I? Oh, yes. See, there's the family that's still down there eating around the table. And there's the father worm telling the story. And that must be Grandpa Worm back behind him. Can you see that? In the Oh, back to the story. Okay. In the distance, Harriet noted some movement at the far side of the meadow. Fawns, she said happily, exclaimed. And as she was watching them taking turns chasing each other and frolicking while their mother grazed, she mused out loud, Yes, little ones, go ahead and play your silly games, for soon you'll be all grown up and have to say goodbye to such free, carefree antics. Silly game? Carefree antics? Leech livers! As young animals play, they literally become smarter as extra neurons are formed in their brains and, of course, Smarter deer have a better chance of survival than dumber ones. You know Bambi's mom never played much as a kid. And look what happened to her. See the deer playing? Around the next bend, the path skirted the lovely pond and Harriet was elated to see a slow-moving, lumpy creature just in front of her. Mr. Turtle, she squealed excitedly, scooping up the startled reptile. And then, with a sympathetic smile, she added, 
What are you doing out of your pond, Mr. Turtle? Well, I think I'll just send you right back home. So Harriet wound up and hurled the bewildered animal back into the middle of the marsh, where it landed with a loud and satisfying carplonk. Well, unfortunately, Mr. Turtle was not a turtle at all, but a tortoise. And while turtles are well adapted for aquatic life, their land-dwelling cousins never evolved into decent dog paddlers. Sadly, the little reptile sank to the bottom. We're promptly drowned. Even worse, who knows how many of our parasitic loved ones went down with the ship. Uh-oh. So she threw what she thought was a turtle into the water where she thought it lived, but it wasn't a turtle. It was actually a tortoise, and tortoises don't live in the water. So you see, it sank to the bottom and drowned. As the middle of the pond bubbled, Harriet's eyes once again were caught by a large and colorful flying insects just above the surface. Dragonflies, she exulted. Oh, look how they dance in the air like winged ballerinas. Winged ballerinas? Winged assassins in Titus might have been closer to the truth. Dragonflies are skilled predators, and if their graceful acrobatics have anything to do with dancing, I'm a sea monkey's uncle. See the dragonflies? Harriet thought she saw something move in the tall grass near her feet. Dropping carefully to her knees, she almost put her hands on a small slug that was wandering by. Recoiling in disgust, she cried, Stay away from me, you slimy thing! And then, seeing the real object of her desire, she lunged forward and came up with her prize. <gasps> Hello, Mr. Frog, she said laughing. I should kiss you and see if you turn into a prince. Fortunately for Harriet, she didn't kiss the little creature, for it wasn't Mr. Frog. She was ho holding Mr. Toad. And like most toads and some frogs, this one packed a powerful, sometimes lethal toxin in its skin. On the other hand, the slug slime was actually quite harmless and perhaps a bit gooey. Kissing out your species is not kissing out of your species is not really recommended, son. But if you have to, always choose a gastropod over an amphibian. See, she's got the frog there. But it's really a toad. If you look over here, there's a mouse in the in the field there. See that? There's stuff all over this book. Ernie Johnson, Mother Worm suddenly burst out. What? Father Worm asked, finding his story interrupted for the second time. Ernie Johnson, his wife repeated. I went to my high school prom with a slug named Ernie Johnson, and Ernie's slime might have been harmless, dear, but it certainly wrecked my evening. Before the night was over, I was wishing I had brought a salt shaker. Well, what made you fall for Dad? The little worm asked. He's slimy too, isn't he? Not exactly, Mother Worm replied. Your father has always been more on what can I call the sticky side. <clears throat> May I please continue, screamed Father Worm. That is, if the two of you are thoroughly through discussing the viscosity, the viscosity of my mucus. Well, see? And there's the, there they are talking about the dad. Releasing the frog, Harriet continued on her way. The trail soon brought her to the edge of a small river where she saw the most remarkable sight Large hook-nosed fish, their red scales shimmering in the sunlight, were struggling to get upstream. Salmon, she joyfully declared, looking for their spawning grounds, I bet. Well, technically speaking, the salmon weren't looking for their spawning grounds. They were smelling them. When salmon hatch, the smell of home is branded into their brains forever. And even though they may wander in the ocean for years, 
Their incredible noses will one day lead them right back to where life began. Now, we earthworms have our own little miracle when it comes to breeding. Each of us contain both male and female reproductive organs. But that's a story I'll tell you when you're a little longer, son. See, there's the salmon going up the stream. And look, they're a bear. And I think they're going fishing for the salmon because that's what bears eat, is the salmon. As the trees closed in on Harriet, the forest grew darker and darker. Sensing that she was being watched, Harriet looked up to a nearby tree and it was momentarily uh, startling to see a pair of large, ominous eyes staring back at her. Oh, I recognize you now, Mr. Owl, she laughed. And fireflies, she gleefully cried as a little insect suddenly swarmed around her. They're the fairies of the night. She enchanted the forest with their magical little lights. Ha. Ah, see here, you can see the owl. And there are the fireflies around Harriet. Did Harriet not even get to take in by one of the oldest tricks in the nature's book? The old, I'm a scary creature with giant eyeball gag. You see, Mr. Owl was a really a royal moth. An insect, an insect that uses its large wing spots to mimic much more frightening animals. One once scared the dirt out of me. And those fireflies really weren't fireflies at all, but beetles who were using a cold chemical process to produce light that attract potential mates. Beautiful, yes, but anyone thinks they're magical? I've got a head pan in Florida to sell them. Soon, our maiden was confronted with the sight that saddened her deeply. An immense tree, as old as a forest itself, was lying on the ground. Oh, I'm so sorry, said Harriet, touching the fallen giant. Such a tragedy, such a waste. Oh, you poor, beautiful tree. See, the tree's falling down. Well, truthfully, the tree's fate was a far cry from being a waste. These huge nurse trees, as their name implies, are the key to new growth in the survival of the entire forest. In fact, a fallen tree is arguably more alive than a standing one. So much for their mass is taken up with other organisms. As the famous worm once wrote, I think that I shall never see a poem as lovely as a big rotting tree carcass. Harriet was suddenly surprised to come across a little baby bird lying helplessly on the ground. She gently scooped up the scared little creature and searched for a nest in the highest reaches of the tree. Poor little guy, she cooed. Did you fall out of your tree? Well, I'll put you right back where you belong. Climbing the tree, Harriet peered into the nest. There you go, she said, placing the trembling baby bird along its siblings. You two youngsters are together again. See, she climbed the tree and put the baby bird back in its nest. But not for long. As soon as Harriet was gone, the fledging found itself plummeting back to earth. You see, she had rescued a baby golden eagle, a species in which the strongest siblings ensures its own survival by giving his younger brothers and sisters the old heave-ho. Author's note, this behavior always takes place in the parent's absence, which would come as no surprise to the younger siblings of other species. See what happens is the big brother pushed the little brother out of the tree. That's not a good thing to do. Scrambling up the tree, Harriet's view is barred by the sight of the forest fire, raging out of control, but fortunately moving away from her. Oh, the suffering, the loss of life, she lamented. Someone should try to put the fire out. Someone should just mind their own business from nature's point of view. Big, healthy trees don't burn very easily unless the flames are stoked with a lot of fallen branches and debris. Occasionally, fires, 
if certain two-legged vertebrates would just let them run their course, benefit the forest by keeping all the dangerous kindling from piling up. But boy, if it ever does pile up, whoosh! Better watch out for your anterior end. I'll show you that. Yeah. See, Harriet's up in the tree looking at the forest fire. But Harriet's spirits didn't stay dampened for long. She decided it was time to return home. As she hummed a cheery tune, she reflected on how lucky she was to be live in the forest and to be so close to nature. Oh, the things she has seen. But then, without warning, Harriet came across something she didn't want to see. A sight that chilled her blood. Ooh. A snake, she screamed, and trapped within the snake's coils, being slowly suffocated was a small, helpless mouse. The poor creature almost died. It was emitting faint squeaks, and his scared eyes seemed to meet Harriet's in one last look of hope. See right there? Actually, acting quickly, Harriet grabbed a nearby stick and began striking the reptile repeatedly. Take that, you dragon thing. Bonk. In that. Bonk. Two more. Bonk. Bonk. She was hitting the snake. Soon, it was over, and the snake was dead. Boy, he was dead as ever. Catching her breath, Harriet reached down and gently removed the unconscious mouth from the snake's lifeless coil. And as the fair maiden watched, a miracle occurred. The little mouse stirred. He was alive. A minute later, he got groggily to his feet, looked up at Harriet, Harriet and wiggled his nose. Harriet beamed. As she held the little mouse in one hand, she wiped a tear away with the other. See? She put the little fellow down at her feet, where he quickly bound off into the tall grass, safe and sound. Harriet headed home. Good had triumphed over evil, and the forest was a little bit safer for everyone. See? How happy she is? Well, actually, the snake Harriet killed was a rodent-eating predator, and that cute little mouse she saved was a carrier of deadly disease. When Harriet had wiped the tear from her eye, a virus which was living in the mouse's fur invaded her body, and one loving spring morning, Harriet, delirious with fever, stumbled out of her little college, fell over, and died. The end. She died? The little worm yelled. What kind of story is that? That's supposed to cheer me up? Boy, I'm really full of warm, wormy feelings now. Thanks, Dad. See, they're eating their dessert of dirt. Father Worm sat back in his chair, trying to be patient, but secretly thinking his son was perhaps a short neuron or two. Look, my boy, he said, I'm afraid you haven't quite grasped the point of the story. See, they're all sitting around talking. You see, Father Worm began, Harriet loved nature, but loving nature is not the same as understanding it. And Harriet not only misunderstood the things she saw, vilifying some creatures while romanticizing others, but also her own connection to them. Father Worm paused, his eyes narrowing. Ah, connection, son. That's the fateful key that Harriet missed, the key to understanding the nature of natural world. Father Worm sat back, stretching himself out to his full, glorious three and a half inches. Take us worms, for example. We still aerate and enrich the soil, making it suitable for plants. No, 
worms, no plants, no plants, no so-called higher animals running around with their oh-so-precious backbones. He was uh, really getting into it now. Heck, we're invertebrates, my boy. As a whole, we're the movers and the shakers of the planet, spineless superheroes, and that's what we are. And since Father Worm didn't have a fist to bang down on the table, he just yelled, bang. See the Father Worm? The little worm sat there for a moment, thinking about what his father just told him. And it was true. He was feeling a little bit better about his lot in life, maybe even a little proud. But then he remembered something. Okay, I get it. Being a worm ain't so bad. But you're wrong about one thing. That story didn't have a happy ending. You said it had a happy ending. Well, it does, replied his father, if you're a worm. And then he leaned across his table until his face was very close to his son's and said with a big grin, which brings us back to the hair in your dirt. Or should I say, see the father's talking to him. You see the hair in his dirt? Harriet, mother giggled, father guaffed, and the son frowned, then smiled, then broke out in laughter. And after they all stopped laughing, the little worm finished his whole dinner, went to bed, and had the best dreams ever. See, there's a picture. See, it was Harriet's hair he was eating. Author's note. Well, truthfully, earthworms don't really sit around dinner tables complaining, telling stories, laughing, and so on. On the other hand, they do have a message for all of us. See? The end. Okay, well, that was a long book. We read, sat down and read the whole thing. I hope you enjoyed it. Maybe next time we'll pick a shorter one too. So I hope everybody had a good time and enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading it. You can always tell that. And we'll be in touch and do some more stories later on. Love everybody. Bye.